Byram Brittle uh, did a freedom of action uh, request of the Japanese government for the Pfizer uh, data, and he got a biodistribution uh, chart. And I've, I th I'm pretty sure I linked to the original uh, uh, data in my paper. And this uh, uh, graph was created from that Pfizer data. So this is not the Pfizer data itself from the Pfizer study. This is a graph, and people have double-checked and triple-checked this. Yeah, it's a summary graphic. It's a summary accurate, graph accurate. so that you can I see have visually. Seen, I did review the primary data, and I concur that the primary data is consistent with the graph that you have nicely summarized. Right. And so what you see from this graph is that when you inject in the shoulder, it um, these... Do you want to walk through the... To teach the listener how it shows that? How it shows. What you yeah, doing? what you're just saying. So, yeah, there, some of these people, some people will just listen to this. So what we're yeah, looking yeah. at oh, is a graph <laughs> of different lines of concentration of is this spike protein in what, various no, tissues. No. No. Yes, it's a lipid nanoparticle. Oh, it's the lipid nanoparticle, yeah. which is the, the, delivery, the delivery mechanism. Right. It's like yeah, the, it's, it's like the, the Fed. It's, it, for, is, for it is the drug. Well, for it's people the, at home, the, it's, it's it's the box. It's the box in which it's the a mRNA proxy for the drug. So the mRNA is what causes the manufacture of the spike protein. But if you find the lipid nanoparticles, that tells you that your drug got to this location. Right. It's it's the delivery the, box, effectively. It's the FedEx delivery box that that has the mRNA inside. This this is you're exactly right. This is the lipid component. Yeah. Right. Uh, that does the delivery. Okay, so good. So what we've got here are different lines that tell you over time from a quarter of an hour to 48 hours where you find what the concentration in various tissues are. And you've got some strong signals here. You've got it in whole blood, not surprisingly, over the first four hours. In other words, it's moving around, it's circulating. That in and of itself is unusual. And concerning. Right. It should okay. be in the it wasn't, it wasn't, fluid. So, so the, the, forgive me, um, yep. just to get a little more precise, we've administered by needle into the deltoid of this complex. Yeah. And you're just tracking the lipid part of it now. There's also an RNA part of it. But as you say, it quickly moves into the blood. Plasma is the cell-free fraction. That's the yellow mustard line. And the gray line is whole blood. So that includes the cellular part of blood. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. Okay. And then we get lines that rise. So all of these things decline as basically this diffuses through the body, which actually is not what you would hope. You would hope it would stay in the arm, but it's basically diffusing through the body. So concentrations are dropping as it gets more and more evenly distributed. And then concentrations are rising conspicuously in two places as we close in on 48 hours. One of them is in the ovaries where it goes sky high. That's really frightening. Anybody that's looked at this data says, what? Yeah, that is a, <laughs> that is a very yes, frightening and, signal. And, 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 and it's the, the cognitive dissonance between what the CDC says is that this is safe for pregnant women. Right. This is perfectly safe. And it's on the CDC website. It's unbelievable. It's at some level, it's not safe for women at all. I mean, this is this is Right. This is right. So, right. so let's, let's just, pregnant let's, 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 it's before, not just we, pregnant before we interpret right. the data, let's right. make sure your listeners understand it. Okay. So the ovaries show a high concentration. For whatever reason, it's ending up in the ovaries uh, of preferentially. The Yes, the lipid is ending up there. And then the other place that we have a signal, which I think suggests something we need to worry farther down the road. You tell me, Robert, if I'm on the right track here or not. But the fact that it shows up concentrating in bone marrow. Bad news. Actually, that suggests that you could end up with, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I'm saying we need to look for something like leukemias showing up here because of their creation in bone marrow. I know from other work that it also seems to show up preferentially in in uh, lymph nodes, which raises the question of whether or not uh, lymphomas might be created. In any case, these are possible long-term effects that we have no way of knowing <coughs> don't arise because these things have not been injected into people for more than a year. So, so, so we have two adverse event signals that are starting to become apparent, my friends at the FDA tell me, okay, um, uh, that are relevant to what you're saying. Okay. You're, you're focusing on bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So typically aplastic anemia, leukemia, lymphoma, those kinds of things might, if, if there are, is going to be, is going to be a signal. 
we might see it six months, three years, nine years. Okay, hard to tell because um, this is a progression of cancer that mm -hmm. often requires multiple mutations. Yep. Okay. So, so let's just park that. Yeah. Um, it but is a risk. Said, it is a risk that should be monitored. Well, wait a second. Wait a second. Well, you said you said somebody is beginning to see a signal of something, but I didn't get what it was. Yeah. So I was going to get into that. Okay. Um, there's two signals that are starting to, um, in we don't have time to go into the nuance of how come it takes so long for them to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Okay. But um, one of them is uh, thrombocytopenia. That's not having the platelets. Okay. Okay. What which is, are manufactured that, in the bone marrow. Which are manufactured. So I'm, right now we're focusing on bone marrow signals. Okay. Um, thrombocytopenia is one of them. Another one that is very hard to understand that's starting to come up in the database is reactivation of latent viruses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this Herpes is shingles. Zoster. Shingles yeah. is an example of that, but there are many others, and there's something in the literature about reactivation of human latent human retroviruses. Okay, so it it is it is there are anomalous findings cropping up, and and uh, I concur that uh, it was uh, when I receive these data to evaluate. Um, I gave you that whole story. Okay. Those are two of the things. And by the way, what's really odd to me about the ovarian signal is there's no um, signal in the testis. Right. It's very and, low. And a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Kevin Tamara, has done a lot of thinking and reading about that because it bothers him too. He's a urologist, so he kind of specializes in the male reproductive system. And he has some theories having to do with charge associated because these are charged lipids. So there are particular features of the ovary that may, and as opposed to the testis, that may explain some of this. But it doesn't get us away from the two core things. Number one, this was known with the original data packages. The Japanese data package is essentially a historic document. It's different from what the FDA is currently looking at. So they, this is these data have been out there a long time. And yes, we have a whole lot of messaging. But not in public view. Within the purview the confidential, of the regulators. protected, not disclosed this is purview the, yeah, the, and this is company of, confidential. of, of the regulators across the world but not okay. the yeah this so, is so, this was the, so this this messaging that company we're all confidential good, so let's, let's nothing not get to worry lost. about yeah that messaging was inconsistent with these signals that were apparent at least inside of the, that data, the regulators the, knew the data about. or the data yeah okay so they know uh, we've got potential long term we got short term implications in the bone marrow we've got potential long term implications in the bone marrow we have short term implications in the ovaries we've got potential long term implications i would add to the list what i've been worried about most from the beginning are autoimmune disorders that might show up in the long term is that plausible as you say I, I i we talked about this earlier um and for me it's less the lipid component although that certainly has merit yeah. for autoimmune it's more the circulating free spike protein spike, yeah. which we didn't expect right. in in the literature and we were the the, the developers assured us this would not happen. The literature suggested we would not have free spike. Yep. And then Harvard and Brigham did a study in nurses, and lo and behold, we clearly have free spike after vaccination. Yep. And that has a whole other set of implications. But autoimmune development of autoimmune disease against complexes of foreign protein plus normal human proteins is certainly something that you'd have to monitor for. Yep. As we were discussing, the way that that's, that's part of the reason why you typically want a two to three year follow-up period on the initial group of phase three patients to make sure that autoimmune consequences don't develop because they typically take, they time. take time. Right. And okay. this is why, you know, they always say that there's no such thing as a vaccine that was, that is developed fast. You know, the, like the fastest we've ever developed a vaccine has been like, what, like seven years or. Yeah, probably that? if we, unless we go back mid-century when things were loose and right. fast. Right. But there's a reason <laughs> for that. It's not just that, okay, well, we didn't have the technology. We have better technology now. We still need to right. be able to see what the long-term effects is on a 12-year-old. You time. And right. in fact, usually you, you use right. animal models to do that. And the assumptions on which the animal models bring these things to light are faulty. Right. And how do you, well, how or, do you judge or, the, or the effect on a 12-year-old? What, what, yeah. what the animal models give us is a signal 
that alerts us to things that we need to follow up on people. carefully in humans. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so hold on. So just to make this, this segment clear, okay, we've got very alarming short-term stuff. We've got short-term stuff that is alarming on the basis of where we find these lipids, where we find the spike proteins. Those things are reasons for concern because it wasn't supposed to be this way. We've also got an alarming signal in terms of the hazards and deaths or the harms and the deaths that are reported in the system. And there's a reason to think that those are dramatic underreports. Yes. And they're all okay. consistent all right, with, so the, with the spike that's distribution. That's two parts of the, the harm equation. Okay. The harm equation involves, there appears to be short-term harm being done at a, an alarming level. Long-term harm is quite plausible based on what we already know about what's taking place. But we, of course, are going to take time to figure to out whether it's actually find out and then it's going to be too late. You can right. never, you can never, un you can vaccinate yourself, but you can never you unvaccinate. Un 